All right, so uh, let's go ahead and uh, take a look at a couple things. Uh, dealing first off uh, with Canvas, and um, you can see uh, the class here, 122, along with some other classes. And uh, we went through the syllabus last time. Chapter 1 slides. Um, we're just going to go through the slides. There's not going to be a quiz with that. Chapter 2, there'll be a quiz, um, but we'll do those quizzes together in here, right? And as long as you're here and in attendance, I'll give you the points. So I'll probably start handing out the attendance sheet, uh, if not next time, uh, by next week. So I notice we're always, you know, arm to arm here um, on the first day. And by the second day, there's a few more seats. And third day, a few more seats. And all of a sudden, people start deciding that 1.30 on Mondays, Wednesdays is their vacation time, okay? So or their time to go sleep in the library or something. So, um, you know, make sure you're attending class so you're getting those points for the homework. Now, as I had mentioned, I was uh, going to link up the course uh, with McGraw-Hill Connect, okay? So if you would like to purchase this, you don't have to. But if you would like to purchase it, now you can go ahead and click on where it says McGraw-Hill Connect over here in Canvas. And then that will uh, take you to uh, the course. You'll have to go ahead and uh, give them your credit card information. I think there's a two-week trial period, actually. So if you want to mess around with it for a while before you decide to pull the trigger on purchasing it, you can. Um, and so you can see that you would click on Go to My Connect section. And uh, so far, I've got the homework in for the uh, first. Uh, there's no homework for Chapter 1. It's sort of like, you know, the M in managerial counting stands for managerial. I'm not going to put homework assignments up. They don't really have anything in there anyway. Uh, so really, uh, there'll be homework for Chapter 2, 3, 4, which will take us right now, which will take us through the first midterm. And... Um, you know, those are optional if you want to work some of those additional questions in there. Okay, it's the 15th edition that I've linked this up for. If you just want the book, you don't have to buy Connect, so you can just get the book off of Amazon. And if you can only find the 16th, go for it. The 16th is just edition is just as good as the 15th for our purposes. Uh, or you can just buy Connect and get the loose leaf book. Or you could just get Connect and use the ebook. You don't have to do all this. Okay. Or you can do none of the above and just go by the slides, right? Okay. Question? Okay, good. So that should be all linked up now. Um, once, you've, once you've done that, you have to uh, register initially. And then after that, you don't have to do that anymore. You just go to the assignments. And under the assignments, you'll see uh, by chapter, the same thing you saw over there. And so after you've done that first initial link up, then from then on, it'll take you to the uh, homework by chapter. Okay, and again, all that's an optional. Alrighty, question. Um, not specifically, no. Uh, the the midterms are more from the pre, uh, the quizzes, um, but. By the same token, I have had students that told me, oh, I went in and I did the homework and it was really helpful. So that's why I put it there and so you may find the same. So it might not be a bad idea to, especially during this trial, to give this, they give us two weeks trial period. Okay, and try it out. Connect is pretty good. It's got some things that are irritating, but it's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot better than uh, my accounting lab. I'm ready to go. To Pearson's headquarters and say something to him. Um, I don't know to what extent they match up, but if you get the textbook, the homework problems are in the back of the chapters, you know. And what I'll do is I'll put the solutions up. Okay, so um, so you won't be seeing the drawback there is you won't be seeing. Um, what I've called out specifically in Connect, unfortunately, but you will see um, the um, the answers to all the homework problems in the back of the book once I put the solutions up. So I'll do that. Excuse me, don't let us keep you up. <laughs> okay. 
Oh, yeah. You should be able to get a 15th edition. If you can find one in print somewhere, you should be able to get a 15th edition for like 20 bucks. And I, that's why I picked the 15th edition because I'm looking at the 16th, and all they did was like shuffle the chapters a little bit. I'm like, why am I not going to use the 16th just to shuffle some chapters? So, yeah, if you can find the 15th. If not, find a used, used copy of the 16th. It'll still work. Okay. Question? Yes. No, you don't have to. We'll learn from the chapters and the quizzes, okay? Um, then again, you know, some people think that's a little thin in terms of the volume, you know, the reps you get. And so if you want more reps, then you might want to get the homework. Yeah. Okay. What we tend to do is um, slides, practice I call it practice midterm sometimes. Slides, quiz, slides, quiz, slides, quiz. And then we stick with our test date, even if we're through the slides and the quizzes. And then we do some, uh, you know, we start really piling the weight on and then we do a bunch of practice midterms until we're finally, hopefully, you know, strong enough to take the midterm is the, is the objective here. And the final, of course. All righty. Okay, good, guys. Let's go ahead then if that's uh, all we've got administratively. And let's go ahead and take a look at uh, slides from Chapter 1. Okay, some very basic stuff. Let me take this out of presenter view so you can see the whole slide if you're looking at this later. Okay, and... Um, What's going to happen in managerial counseling? By the way, you see all these uh, people that contributed to the book. And you see all this alphabet soup after their names. You know what PhD is. You know what CPA is. Do you know what CMA is? Certified, Certified management accountant, right? Okay, sort of like the CPA, but not as good. Okay. Uh, CPA is the only designation up here that is a license to do something, right? It's a license from the states, okay? Uh, so these other ones, well, PhD is pretty, you know, pretty impressive, right? Um, CIA, Certified Internal Auditor, okay? So all of these are uh, pretty good uh, designations. I don't know, what's DBA? Oh, is that what it is? Huh? Database administrator. Uh, okay, so anyway, he's like, well, why'd you mention it then if you don't know what these mean? Okay, all right, so uh, let's go ahead and let's take a look at what we're going to be doing in this class and how it differs from financial accounting. Okay, so what have we been doing in financial accounting, business 20, intermediate, all that? It's all about following rules for the preparation of financial statements that are used for that are prepared for external users, right? Creditors, investors, et cetera, right? And so there's some very specific things that the Financial Accounting Standards Board, FASB, calls out that they want us to include in those financial reports. How should it be presented? How should it be accounted for, right? And, um, you know, it gets a little bit uh, daunting sometimes when you have to start dealing with things like other comprehensive income and how do we deal with the... Um, you know, earnings per share information and all that. It's very rules-based, okay? What we're going to be dealing with in this class is um, really two uh, kind of issues. One you don't see on this screen, and it's the completion of your discussion of financial accounting, and that in the financial accounting courses, we always presumed a retail entity. They've bought inventory that's already been manufactured, and now they're going to sell it to a third party. In this class, we're going to be dealing with a manufacturing entity, and we're going to see how they're going to run costs through their accounting system as we go from raw materials to work in progress to finished goods, and then ultimately where we ended up in business 20 and intermediate accounting, cost of goods sold. So we're going to have to finish up the discussion really if we still have a 
toe or a foot or whatever in financial as we complete that process. Okay, that will take us through the first midterm. I want to get all the accounting out of the way. Debits and credits, journal entries are still in bounds. And then when we get past that, when we get into chapter five and beyond, we are going to be looking at it more from what you see on this slide from the input, from the standpoint of internal uses. So now we're looking at how management will use the financial reports to make the different types of um, points that you see here on the uh, board here, which is on the screen, which is planning, which is achieving control, which is decision making. Okay. Now, when we look at planning, control, decision making, I thought I took this slide out of here because why do I need the same thing twice? But here it is still. But anyway, we have what? We have our uh, planning. Okay. And the key part of planning is our budgets. And we're going to be talking about the development of budgets and monitoring these budgets when we start to get into chapter eight. So big deal for our budgeting will be for our planning will be chapter eight as we develop budgets. Okay. Chapter uh, uh, decision making is what we get into when we say what should we be selling? What is the proper product mix? Who should we be serving? Uh, how should we execute our uh, business strategies. I always want to say who should we execute, but uh, since we got who, what, and who up here, but it's how, okay, should we execute, okay? And then we have controlling. So what happens? We have our budget, but then we're going to be comparing our budget to the actual results, right? And that will allow us to see if we are achieving our budgetary goals, and if not, we'll make adjustments from there and uh, continue to monitor as we control the operations of the entity. Okay. Okay. I mentioned the CMA exam. Okay. CMA exam, certified management accountant. Okay. And so you can be certified as a management accountant, meaning that you are expert in what? In more of the internal reporting aspects of a company than the external reporting aspects. External reporting aspects is CPA, right? That's what we're all about is CPA. CMA could be a certification if you plan to be more of a internal accountant, maybe working as the uh, CFO or something of a company, uh, controller, that sort of thing. Okay, anybody plan to get their CMA? Nobody? No one person? thing I get sometimes, I get CMAs come up to me sometimes and say, CMA is as good as CPA. The other one I get all the time is, enrolled agent is as good as CPA. And I'm always like, okay. You know, I didn't ask. I didn't ask you. Okay. So, again, CPA is sort of, you know, more recognized, I guess. Um, but uh, you have these other certifications. Okay. If you take the CMA exam, it's a, um, got different parts to it, and uh, you can see some of the things that we're going to be dealing with in this class come up in part one and part two. Okay. Okay, now, the reason I mentioned the CMA, the test that you take is from the uh, Institute of Management Accountants. Okay, Institute of Management Accountants, IMA, they're the ones that write the exam that you end up taking if you're going to uh, get your CMA. But what I found very useful, in fact, I think I use this in all their classes, their guidelines for ethical behavior. Okay, and I think it's important that you start thinking about ethical behavior early before you do something unethical that you have to live with, okay? And so let's just uh, talk about some of the aspects of uh, ethical behavior here, dealing with confidentiality, okay? Um, you are not to, uh, prov uh, you know, you're supposed to maintain confidentiality with your employer, with your, um, with your clients, that sort of thing. Okay, so uh, you shouldn't disclose information. Now, if you're legally obligated to do so, uh, like as a CPA or something, if you get called in court, you are required to disclose the information that you have. There's no CPA client, uh, CPA client privilege like there is client attorney privilege. Okay, so uh, but you shouldn't uh, disclose confidential information, obviously. 
uh, particularly if it is uh, illegal to do so. Um, if you're working with tax data, for example, uh, that's a you're, it's illegal to uh, to disclose an individual's tax data to a third party, right? Okay, so these sorts of things uh, come into the uh, ethical confidentiality area. Okay, integrity. Okay, uh, you should refrain from conduct that would uh, prejudice carrying out uh, your duties ethically. Abstain from activities that might discredit your profession. Mitigate conflicts of interest. Um, so, um, is it okay to uh, keep a client's data if they haven't paid a bill? Is it okay to do that? You have a client, they haven't paid their bill. You're getting mad because they haven't paid their bill, so you tell them, I'm going to keep your accounting records until you pay the bill. Is that okay? Might motivate them to pay you, right? Okay. Not okay, right? Okay, we have specific rules around that. You can't just hold their data hostage to a payment. Okay, these are the type of things that we talk about when we talk about uh, operating with integrity. Okay. Um, I think this is pretty good in terms of how we uh, handle conflict. And uh, every time I look at this, it's like, what are these twin brothers got in an argument one day or something? But um, let's just take a look. And um, if you have conflict, discuss conflict with the immediate supervisor or next highest uninvolved managerial level. The immediate supervisor is the CEO. Consider the board of directors or the audit committee. Uh, contact with levels above the immediate supervisor should be initiated with the supervisor's knowledge, assuming the supervisor is uh, not involved, right? So basically, they're telling you as long as your supervisor isn't involved, your best bet is to what? Go to your supervisor if you have identified some sort of ethical conflict, okay? Now, I think that these guidelines and just this idea of go to your immediate supervisor is a... Um, good advice, and uh, it's easy advice, and it's something to keep in mind because it's not a question of if you'll have an ethical conflict, it is what? It is when, okay? I think that uh, we tend to think that, you know, we go and we choose the ethical conflict. Meanwhile, the ethical conflict will what? Choose you, right? So, um, anyone have one you want to share? And please, I don't want a moment of indiscretion, you know, like, oh, well, I, you know, I was hanging out with my friend's significant other and it just happened, you know, I don't, I don't want to hear that kind of thing, you know, um, you know, something that you can share here, ethical conflict, where you were like, how did this happen? How am I supposed to handle this? Not yet? Uh huh. That was a big one. Tell us. Do you want me to pause it? No, it's okay. Huh? Okay, go ahead. Speak your name into the microphone, please. <laughs> Yeah, that was a whole big thing, right? Um, because a lot of people were pressured to meet quotas. Yeah, you were being pressured to meet certain quotas, open certain accounts at Wells Fargo. And, um, you know, that one would have done you a lot of good to go to your supervisor, right? I mean, this is one where the whole process broke down, right? I mean, when you think about it, this whole idea of corporate governance where the board of directors will kick in and do their job. That's all a prayer, isn't it? That the auditors will do their job. We pray that that happens. And sometimes our prayer is not answered, right? And they end up getting busted by, what was it, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau? Yeah, I think it was uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau was the one that ultimately busted them out. You know, you don't want a government agency to uh, bust you out on those things. We hope that the corporate governance structure itself, boards of directors, audit committees, auditors themselves. I mean, where was 
What is it, uh, KPMG? Right. Is that who audits Wells Fargo? I don't know. I didn't I'm not sure who it is. Who it is either? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's questionable how that happened. And then they ended up having they they didn't see CEO CFO had to resign, right? I and mean, they got called up there by Elizabeth Warren, who is on the uh, Senate uh, Senate Banking Committee. She had a few words to say to them. You know who Elizabeth Warren is, right? No. She's your next president. Oh. Yeah. Okay. I don't. I don't, I don't know. If, <laughs> I don't know if she's gonna run or not, but. Uh, Maybe she'll run for president, and Bernie Sanders will run for vice president. I don't know, but um, but it was a big deal, right? Yeah. Okay, good. It happened to me because before I worked there, um, I found out I had like a global remittance account, and I never opened it until I worked there, and I figured it out. I was like, someone's using this to like. Yeah. 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 Okay, that's a good one. Yeah. Uh, any others? Now that we've had a brave soul, go ahead and. Uh, I had a audit that I was on, uh, uh, audit of U.S. Forest Service, and uh, what we were doing in the audit of U.S. Forest Service was looking at how they accounted for the cost of the forest, right? Okay. So what happens? They had this accounting system in which they went ahead and put all costs in a pool, not a pool of water, but a pool, cost pool, and then they would allocate those costs based on um, – you know, basically a hundred year, um, they would they would uh, amortize those costs based on a hundred year life of the forest. They're saying, okay, it takes about a hundred years to go from a you know regional original sapling to something that you could harvest for uh, for timber, and the, they'll go and they'll sell a whole parcel of the uh, forest. They'll just sell that off to the highest bidder. And then when they do the bids, they have to come in with these sealed bids. The bids are all sealed, and the highest bid ends up winning that section of the forest. And so they make determinations of the cost and that sort of thing. Well, when we looked at their system, we found that they were including in those 100-year uh, deple uh, depletion pools, they were including things like roads, bridges that they needed, you know, not huge bridges like the Golden Gate Bridge, but bridges they needed to get over certain areas uh, into the forest, drainage systems that they used to keep the water from, uh, you know, accumulating in different parts of the forest, etc. Are drainage systems, roads, bridges, do they last 100 years? Yet they had them in a pool that they were depleting over 100 years. So we looked at that and said, hey, that's not a proper accounting. You need to have separate pools for different assets that have different lives. Yes, the forest itself, the trees themselves may have a 100-year depletion base, but not the roads and those sort of things. So they came back and they looked at that and they said, well, you can't criticize us for that because – your office, GAO, my office, the Government Accountability Office, we were doing the financial statement audit. Your program people were in here just a couple years ago. They looked at this whole thing, and they signed off and didn't say that this was a problem. So how can you raise it up now, two years later, after we've invested in our cost accounting system and have established it in a manner that we think is consistent with what the program office was saying well i've been with gao probably for you know three four years at that point in time and i'm like oh, i don't know am i supposed to not raise this up you know i still think it's an issue they're not accounting for this correctly now i uh what happens if you deplete the forest over a longer life than you should or certain costs associated with the forest over a longer life than you should so instead of using, I don't know, 20 years for a road, 30 years for a road, you use 100 years for a road. What does that do to your to your depletion expense? Huh? It keeps it lower, doesn't it? Okay. So in effect, they're doing what? They're understating the cost of the forest, aren't they? So if they're understating the cost of the forest, they're potentially going to be auctioning it off for less than its value. In other words, they're depleting a natural resource at what? At less than cost. They're not replenishing that by selling it for and getting the proper resource in the government. So it's something that environmentalists, that sort of thing, might be concerned about, right? 
okay? So I'm sitting there and I'm like, well, if I just say okay and I sweep this under the rug, I have the problem that we're understating the cost of the forest. So I go ahead and I uh, bring it to my supervisor. My supervisor says, I don't know either. I'm not sure what we should do. So he bumps it up, gets bumped up, gets bumped up, get called in one day. He says, okay, get all your uh, work papers together. We have to brief the Comptroller General of the United States about this, and we're going to have to do that this week. Okay, Comptroller General of the United States is the head of the Government Accountability Office. It's a 15-year appointment, so it is uh, it is appointed by uh, it is appointed by the Senate, appointed by the President, confirmed by the Senate. 15-year appointment. Okay, that's a long term, isn't it? How long is the term for President? Four years, I guess. I hope. I hope that's all we have. Okay, four years, maybe eight years, right? It's almost as double. Senators are what? Six years? Okay, although they don't have a term limit, but uh, still, you know, six years and then they can run again. 15 year appointment. That's a long appointment. Why so long? Why 15 years? Why would you give the Comptroller General of the United States, who's like the auditor of the federal government, why would you give an auditor like that 15 years? Because he's really, 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 they appoint really, really young ones. So they can hang in there for 15 years. The current one took the job when he was like 60. Everybody was like, when's Gene Dodaro going to retire? Geez, he's getting ready to retire, I would think. He's almost 60. And then all of a sudden, he gets Comptroller General. So he'll be working there until he's 75. Gene Dodaro, good guy. Smart guy, you know. I always wondered how he, because, you know, we would be in meetings with him before he was Comptroller General. And uh, he would always... Um, you know, like know everybody's name and what's going on with them. Like he'd be like, "Oh, hi, Mary. I heard your dog is sick." I'm like I didn't even know her name was Mary. Okay, <laughs> all right. So uh, why so such a long term? So he gets to know everybody's dog's name. Yeah, independence. Okay, makes it a much more independent position if it's a 15-year term. They can't, you can't touch this. You don't know my address, right? You can't lay a glove on me for 15 years, right? Okay, so it's a much more independent position, isn't it? Which is what you want for an auditor, okay? In fact, I'm of the opinion that the GAO, and I'm not objective, that the GAO is the most independent audit organization the world has ever known. I mean, you think of different audit organizations that are out there, and you've got what? You've got CPA firms, but they're hired by their client, aren't they? Right? Okay, you've got different federal agencies, government agencies that do auditing, but they're usually inside the very department that they're auditing. GAO is what? Sitting over here in Congress, and we're looking at what? Executive branch agencies. Okay, so, and I say we, I'm retired, but I still feel like I'm part of the brethren, okay, part of the cloth. So anyway, so we're going to meet with the G, with the uh, Comptroller General to sit there and talk about this issue now. And I'm like, oh, great. You know, now we're really in trouble. So we go ahead and we brief them. Well, this is the way things are. We see that they have these problems. They're saying that we had another office come in previously and raise some points. And the Comptroller General says, well, just tell them that that was then and this is now. Okay, whatever we said then was then, and we are now finding this issue. Call them as you see them, guys. That's it. Okay, so we went ahead with that finding, and yeah, we took some egg on the face. And in, the, in their rebuttal, Forest Service came out and said, well, before GAO had said this, now they're saying this. They're not being consistent in their approach to us, whatever. But it was better to take that heat then than to have what gone ahead and just sort of swept it under and said, okay, well, we said that before, so we better not say anything now. Meanwhile, what? Down the line through Freedom of Information Act, somebody finds out that we were kicking that issue around and we decided not to report it and maybe an environmental group or something says that there's a problem and that we were under, uh, the Forest Service was understating the cost of the forest and GAO knew about it and didn't bring it to the light of day. Okay. So, again, it is better to uh, to go up the chain, go ahead and talk about whatever the issue is, okay? Uh, 
uh, try not to, uh, you know, try not to, um, you know, suppress it if you don't have to. I mean, if it's everybody in the company is doing it and forcing it and even opening accounts for you or something, I'm not sure how much you can do. You didn't meet quota, right? Okay. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right, good. Let's go ahead then and let's take a look at uh, strategic management perspective. Okay, and we're talking about a game plan that will enable the company to attract customers by distinguishing itself from its competitors. Okay. Okay, we also have um, customer value propositions. And you can fall into or or I don't know if you fall into this, but you can place yourself in any one of these areas. For example, if you're talking about uh, product leadership strategy, offer a high quality product, can you think of a uh, company that might meet that? Might try to find themselves in that niche? Apple. I mean, that's the usual answer, right? Product leadership. We're going to innovate. We're going to always come out with the better phone, whatever it is, right? Okay. Okay, good. How about uh, operational excellence? Deliver products and services faster, more conveniently, and at lower prices. Huh? Amazon, right? Okay, good. How about customer intimacy strategy? Uh, understand and respond to individual customer needs. Financial services, sure, yeah, could be, right? Depending on what your client's need is, you're going to try to structure something that will meet their particular uh, financial needs. Um, the one that I always think of when I think of this is like uh, IT security. Okay, so if you have what? If you have a smaller company, you're not going to put all of these IT controls in real sophisticated, complicated process. Whereas if you have a more sophisticated customer or you have a financial institution or you're having a client that is handling uh, private data, then you're going to be what? Much more sophisticated in how you um, go about uh, not sophisticated, but you're going to have to design something for each individual customer. Okay. All right. Good. Um, risks. You ever heard of enterprise risk management? Okay. ERM. Okay. COSO. Um, the committee sponsoring organizations of the Treadway Commission has a model for considering um, how to manage risks, okay? So what happens? Risks, sometimes people think, well, risks are things that might happen, and so you're going to uh, consider some ways of uh, dealing with those things that might happen. And it turns out that risks are things that you need to think of as they are going to happen, okay? Because I think that's uh, part of the problem. You think, well, maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't, so let's not do anything about it. You have to assume that they are going to happen and then what think about the consequences and how you want to deal with that okay so when you deal with risk you could avoid the risk you're assuming something's going to happen and the way to make it not happen is stay away from the activity that's generating the risk let's say you're an oil company and uh, you want to start drilling off the California coast for oil What's the risk that something bad might happen? What's the bad thing that might happen? Huh? You might have an oil spill, right? Do you want to be the oil company that messed up and destroyed the beautiful California coast? No. So you say, you know what? We ain't doing it. Forget about it. Even if it is allowed, even if the government's going to uh, allow for increased drilling uh, in California, we're not going to do it because we don't want to be the bad, uh, you know, the bad neighbor that caused the problem, right? So we want to be socially responsible. So you simply avoid it, okay? Uh, you could accept the risk. You could say, you know what? We're going to go for it. We're going to do it. 
we're going to go ahead and we're going to drill the oil and let whatever happens happens because we think that there's some commercial benefit that outweighs that risk, right? So you just go ahead and accept the risk. Um, let me ask you something. Are there some entities that cannot avoid a risk? They have no choice? Insurance company avoid risk all the time. They just don't insure you. They just look at that and say, sorry, we can't insure you. I mean, they're experts at avoiding the risk just by not insuring you. My dad is 87. They wouldn't give him long-term uh, long catastrophic insurance because he's 87. Right? So they just avoid it. I should have got it for him when he was maybe in his 60s because in my office I can put him on mine. And I, I didn't think of it until more recently. So they send somebody over and they start asking them all these questions, like, um, what of the, what of the, th they tell him these words and then he has to remember the words that they told him, and I'm sitting there like, I can't even remember the word. What did they say? He, he was doing pretty good actually, but eventually they came out and said, oh well, we can't do it, you know. They give him four animals. They say, which of these is uh, different than the others? Um, a zebra, well, what was it, uh, a lion, a uh, coyote, a, um, what was it, a tiger, and a sheep. And so my dad says, uh, <laughs> And I'm thinking, well, three of them are, are wild, and one of them is domesticated, right? The sheep is domesticated, and then my dad says, well, the three can eat that one. <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay, you know. So anyway, but they decided, you know, that he couldn't get it. So they can avoid risk all the time. I mean, they don't want to insure you. They just don't insure you. I think I mentioned earthquake insurance, right, in here last time? Maybe it was my governmental class. It, you, can't, you can't buy earthquake insurance directly from the insurance companies. You have to go through the federal government, right, to get the earthquake insurance. The insurance company said, we ain't doing it. We are not going to insure you against the idea that your house will not be knocked down by an earthquake or burn up in a fire that's caused by the earthquake, which we would have to cover because that particular event could collapse our entire insurance fund. So they won't even insure you. The federal government has to back that in order for there to be such thing as earthquake insurance. Okay, So they avoid that all the time. Okay. Anybody here got earthquake insurance? Nobody ever gets it because it's prohibitively expensive. Even after all that, the other way they protect themselves is by putting the premium so high that uh, nobody ever ends up buying earthquake insurance. Okay. All right. Uh, what was I talking about? Is there some entities that cannot avoid the risk? They can avoid it. Just don't do it. Just don't develop anything new. All right? Stick with the tried and true. I'm thinking, uh, huh? Defense what? Defense courses? Well, you're on the right track. I'm thinking, you know, government agencies can't avoid the risk, right? What happens? FEMA can't say, well, we're going to avoid the risk. We're just going to not, you know, do anything when there's a when there's a hurricane or something, right? Like kind of like they're doing in Puerto Rico. No. We're going to just sit there and we're not going to do anything when there's a hurricane. We're just going to let it happen, whatever happens, and everyone's on their own, right? So they can't avoid that risk. They have to just sit there and do what? Accept it, right? So sometimes you can't avoid the risk, okay? You could do what? You could reduce the risk. Reduce the risk is what? Put some controls in place that will help to potentially mitigate that the problem will happen. So if you're worried that you have a risk that there will be some sort of uh, breach to your computer security, what do you do? 
put up firewalls, right? Increase your protections, right? Okay, and this is probably the one that most of you would focus on is reducing the risk. They didn't put it here, but it is certainly a consideration. You could also, in the COSO model, I don't know why this slide didn't have it, COSO talks about what? Sharing the risk. When you share the risk, now what? That's where insurance comes in, right? And that they will cover you if something happens. Okay. Okay, good. All right. So when you look at some of these in enterprise risk management examples of risk, um, losing market share, poor weather conditions, shutting down operations, website malfunction, okay, and a way that you can reduce that risk is thoroughly test the website before going live on the internet. Can you think of a website that malfunctioned that if they had thoroughly tested the website before going live on the internet, they could have avoided some of the uh, or reduced the risk that some of the things that from some of the things that ended up happening, they could have reduced the risk that that would have happened. A website that yeah, the Affordable Care Act, the Obamacare. Right? What did they do? They sat there and they went live and they weren't ready and they couldn't handle all the traffic and the thing crashed and caused all kinds of problems, right? Okay. What could they have done? They could have thoroughly tested the website before going live. What they could have done is they could have called in a third party to do a web trust uh, um, engagement where a CPA firm will come in and look to see that the website can handle the traffic that they're talking about, et cetera. So there was really no excuse for what happened. It was just poor risk management. Okay, There was absolutely no reason for that, poor risk management. Uh, poor weather conditions, setting, shutting down operations, develop contingency plans for overcoming weather-related disruptions. Can there be other things other than weather-related disruptions? What's another kind of disruption that could occur that you could uh, come up with a contingency plan for? Power outage. Yeah. Power outage. I was on an assignment where um, we were looking at lockbox functions. Lockbox function is where a um, entity will hire a bank to collect their cash receipts and they, they update the uh, bank's records directly, I mean the uh, client's records, the bank updates the client's records directly, okay, and the federal government uses a lockbox system. When you file a tax return and you have to pay, your tax return will go to a different place than if you have a refund coming. If you have a refund coming, that return goes to Fresno. If you have to pay your check and your return, I don't know here in San Jose, but in the San Francisco, it goes to a San Francisco P.O. box. Okay, That tax return then gets on a truck, goes down Highway 101, crosses the San Mateo Bridge, and goes into the greatest city in the world, which is Highway 101, San Francisco South, heading towards San Jose. But before you get to San Jose, you cross the San Mateo Bridge. Just on the other side of that bridge is the greatest city in the world, which is... No, we're on the Foster City side. You go all the way across, that's Hayward over there, okay, which is where I'm from, okay, Hayward, okay. So you go and goes the return, goes to Hayward, and it goes to the IRS lockbox, which is run by a bank in Hayward, okay. They put it there in Hayward because probably the rent's a little cheaper over there, and it's right there in the middle of the bay so they can get over to uh, maybe some of the returns come from different areas. Anyway, what happened was the IRS gives the banks quotas. They tell them, you have to process so many of these returns. And when they process them, all they do is they open up the return, they scan the checks, they have fiber optics that scan the checks and automatically update the government's bank accounts. And they have to keep up with that and process so many. Well, some banks were having trouble keeping up with their quota. And so what they started doing was shredding the returns. They would shred the returns, the checks, the whole thing. 
just shred them because they couldn't keep up and they were afraid that IRS was going to come to an inspection and see that they weren't keeping up. So they just shredded them. Do you think Congress is happy when checks that are headed to the Treasury get shredded? They were none too happy when they found out about this. So they asked us to go, GAO, to go and look around at other lockboxes, not the one that Hayward wasn't doing that, other lockboxes and seeing what was happening. Sam, Hayward came up with a sample. Everyone said, okay, you speak Hayward, John, so you're going to go on that assignment and go over to Hayward and take a look at what's going on over there. So we go over. It was, to be honest with you, one of the dumbest assignments I was ever on because they had us doing audit procedures like people would take their purse and walk into the area where the tax returns were to see if they would be stopped. I don't like any audit procedure where the auditor becomes part of the story. Everyone knows you're the auditor. They're not going to stop you. That's not an objective test. So there's a lot of dumb things that we did on that uh, assignment. But uh, what we found out early on is that they had their backup, their backup for all of that process. And the backup was in San Francisco. So they had the main computer in Hayward. Backup was in San Francisco. What's wrong with that contingency planning, having your backup in San Francisco and your main in Hayward, huh? Same state, same general area. One event could take out both the main and the backup, right? Yeah, so we asked them to move that. And before that engagement was over, they had moved that from, uh, from the backup from San Francisco to Texas, okay? And they moved it off the same power grid. So power outage, right? How about a terrorist attack? How about terrorist attack? Right? Okay. You think, oh, okay, that's a little over the top. Is that really is that really something we need to worry about? September 11th. Okay, what happens? Treasury auctions all of its, the Treasury Department auctions all of its Treasury securities. The government has to borrow money every day to operate, every week to operate. They not know about every day, but every week to operate on Thursday, they borrow some money. They auction the securities on Tuesday. They issue them on Thursday. That's how the government gets money to operate, okay, on a daily basis. So they have the main computer at the bank of uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York which is, you know, a stone's throw away from where the World Trade Centers were. And the backup is in East Rutherford, New Jersey. And so when they put a transaction in the main, it automatically speaks to the backup. And the two systems are constantly going back and forth with each other, making sure that each system has a complete set of data. September 11th comes, what happens? The uh, Federal Reserve Bank main goes down. And they had what? They had everything backed up in uh, East Rutherford, New Jersey. Okay, so all of these things are something that um, you know you can do to mitigate some of these risks. Okay, all right, good. Come over and uh, let's take a look at our different shareholders, uh, stakeholders. Okay, obviously we have our stockholders. Okay, but uh, our and you hear a lot of times. I hear uh, our president a lot of times say, well, my responsibility is just to my shareholders. My responsibility was all to my share, always to my shareholders and justified a lot of the things that he did when he was in business. Is that right? What? Corporations have a broader social agenda than just their shareholders, don't they? Okay, so they have their customers, their employees, their suppliers, environmental. Okay, you just can't go and start polluting up the environment, that sort of thing. Okay, so uh, the social responsibility extends beyond just the shareholders. Okay, um, let's take a look at the um, supply chain. Okay, we go from what? We go from our, our product chain, I guess. You go from research and development to product design to manufacturing to marketing, distribution and then customer service. Um, most products don't make it out of what? R&D. Okay, so most products aren't going to even make it out of the R&D. You think you've got something you can start to design, and if uh, that goes well, then you can start your manufacturing, etc. Okay, lean production. Let's look at the old way first so we can 
opportunity can appreciate more the lean production. Um, so what happens? In the olden days, we would produce goods, we would store them in inventory and wait for a customer to come in, buy something, right? Okay, nowadays they do what? They will go more with a lean process and that um, customer places an order, then we produce, we generate the, uh, the, the production order, we generate whatever it is, the um, components are ordered, production begins, and goods are delivered when needed. Okay, so um, these days we do things more like this. Is there another type of uh, process that's used now more instead of this just wait for the customer order? Kind of a combination of uh, producing and the just in time? Huh? I think Dell is kind of like this, isn't it? You know, you, you order what you want. They make it for you. Huh? Tesla is kind of like this. Huh? Toyota, what do they do? As you order the car? Oh, okay. I'm thinking... Um, of these, I see more and more they have now like these prescriptions. Like you order a prescription to socks or something stupid like that, or shaving supplies. You, you subscribe to it. I mean, they're coming up with everything now. You hear, oh yeah, you know, from now on, you can order all your you know, underwear for the rest of your life through us, you know. Um, so that's kind of a new way of doing things. I look at that, I'm like, why would somebody do that? I mean, you order, you know, these the, the hats that look good now, and you're getting to a year-long prescription, or two-year-long prescription, and two years from now, you know, six months from now, no one's wearing that stupid hat anymore. So I don't know. I don't, I don't think. But it is a way to what? To sit there and kind of have the combination where we don't necessarily have to wait for a customer to order each thing we do what we get our customers to buy into subscribing over time and, and uh, we can kind of control our production that way right okay all right anytime you see her you should be happy her uh, She's cool, the phone is not, okay, but um, so that's the end of the philosophical discussions in this class, okay. Going forward, it's going to be debits, credits, crunching numbers, 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 accounting, accounting. So I hope you enjoyed the uh, fun discussion. You should be bringing your calculator to class. You should be bringing your calculator to class. Each time as we go through and start with Chapter 2 on Wednesday, okay? All right, guys, I will see you on Wednesday.